<laughs> what kind of license do you need to drive a bookmobile? Do you need like an RV license? And or I, and it's I, big. I stopped because I said to myself, I don't need to go down that route. <laughs> Hey, Maniacs. <laughs> I was trying for something kind of dramatic. Hey, Maniacs. <laughs> In a radio voice. Yeah. Hey, Maniacs. It's Midsummer Maniacs, a podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. I'm Sarah. And I'm Mark. And as usual, if your kids can handle the episodes, then they can handle the podcast. This is a pretty tame one, though. You can't handle the podcast. Yeah, this is a pretty tame one. I'm confused by this episode. Okay. Frankly, I'm just going to say that right up front. I'm calling this season, season six, episode one, I'm calling this right now the bookmobile season. (laughs) Because the bookmobile makes a further appearance. And I delve deep into the bookmobile already in the next episode. All right. But before we dive into uh, A Talent for Life, which is season six, episode one. Yes. Tonight's topic. I have a little gossip. Oh, give it. Are you Gwen the gossip? No. Okay. (laughs) We'll talk about Gwen the gossip. No, I'm Sarah the gossip. Okay. So I have a Google alert for Midsummer Murders that comes up in my news feed. Yep. First of all. It's amazing how many different news outlets from big sources to tiny little village blogs will mention Midsummer Murder in completely unrelated ways just to get the keyword in there, just to get yeah, the traffic. Like, absolutely. Boy, there was a shoe sale at Bob's Shoes and it was like a Midsummer Murder in there, you know, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but... Across my newsfeed for no reason whatsoever that I can tell because it's not even a current thing, but it's something I didn't know. Uh, today was a story about Fiona Dolman, who plays Sarah Barnaby. Yes. And the fact that she was actually pregnant when Sarah Barnaby was pregnant. Oh. But she had just left her husband of like 15 years. Okay. And was pregnant by... A younger lover who she only went out with for a little bit. This is a whole episode. And then broke up. Yeah. But then she was like, hey, I'm in my 40s and I'm pregnant and I never thought I would be able to have a kid. So So the article that I read proposed that actually Betty exists because Fiona Dolman was pregnant. Oh, okay. So if, if the actress hadn't been pregnant, we might not have Betty. Who is their daughter- who, in the show. Yeah. Yeah, so the Barnabys had to be pregnant because the actress was pregnant. Oh, okay. So, so there you go. A little gossip. I couldn't confirm it for a fact that they didn't have plans on the Barnabys having a child until the actress became pregnant, but that's what the article proposed. Oh, okay. What's your gossip? Uh, it actually wasn't actual gossip, so we're going to skip it and oh. pretend I didn't say anything. <laughs> Because the, there's all these rumors around that there's going to be a Strictly Dancing uh, Midsummer crossover. And because that's what came up in my feed. Oh, why wouldn't you want to, why would you want to cut that? Well, I don't know. I guess we don't have to cut it. I think it's very interesting. You guys have no idea what we cut and what we don't cut, so. I always like when I hear a podcast where somebody says, well, you're going to end up cutting that. And you know they didn't because you hear it. And that's funny. Yeah. So that could either be a Midsummer episode that includes a Strictly reference. Yes. But we've already had the dancing in the newest season. Yes, we did. So that would be kind of lame. Yep. Or it could go the other way, and they could have an episode of Strictly that's just actors from Midsummer. I actually think... Based- that would be funny. <laughs> I'd love to see John Nettles out there cutting a rug. Okay, this says, and this is dated... Thursday, January 9th. Okay, so this is this is hot off breaking the news. Presses. Neil Jungeon, who plays John Barnaby in Midsummer Murders, has made a surprising revelation that he would like to be a contestant oh. on Strictly Come Dancing. And it had uh the actor admitted he might spoil it for everyone. Because <laughs> he's oh, such a good dancer. You no, know, you know why it's like that? Mm. Because the new episodes are just airing in England right now. 
And so the new episode with the dancing, I think, ep- uh, shows this week. Wait a minute. We got it before they did? We got it before they That's did. That's never happened. That we, uh, I'm kind of scared of mentioning it to British people because we got it before they did. <laughs> So that's why, like, there's the story ah, and everything. That's interesting. So they knew there was a dancing plot. And so they said, hey, would you want to be on Strictly? And he was like, yeah, I kind of would. That'd be kind of fun. And that's the end of the story. I think that's that's all there the is to it. The story. My gossip was better. Yeah, it was. Mine has, anyway, mine episode. Has, mine has bastards in it. A talent for Life, yeah. season six, episode one. Yes. Set in Malum Bridge. Yeah. And it has another aptly named pub. So we went from the fish, the, we went the chalk and gown, the chalk and gown to the old fisherman. Yeah. Which as far as I can tell actually exists as a location. I'm like that's what the pub is actually sure called. There's probably many pubs called yeah, that. They didn't have so. to rename it. And, and Cully's back. Oh, it's the bookmobile series. <laughs> Whenever they show the bookmobile, I think they should play the um, the theme from the um, Wicked Witch of the West and Wizard of Oz. When it goes oh, down yeah. the road. Yep. Not that Cully's evil, but it would just make it funnier. Or yeah, uh, Benny Hill. Yakety sack. And fast forward. Well, it kind of looks like it's stalking. But okay, we're getting way ahead of ourselves because there's stuff to cover beforehand. Yes. There's a row. There's slapping. There's slapping at the old fisherman. Um, I have a note that says, aptly named pubs are on. And the slapping is done by Honor Blackman. Now, you have a theory of how they got Honor Blackman on Midsummer. So Honor Blackman, well-known British actress, most well-known for being pussy galore in in Goldfinger. Yeah. I almost said Dr. No and... A, a billion, because a billion people listen to us. A James bi- Bond fans went, no! no! But no, she's in... Um, Goldfinger. Goldfinger. She's <laughs> Goldfinger's sort of second in command, and she has a squadron of female fighter pilots that help her. Yeah, that's but of course the Jim, fembots in Austin Powers are based on them, yes. right? But James Bond, with the power of his lips... Changes her to become a good person. It is Sean Connery. Yes, it is Sean Connery. His kiss is magical. Yes. <laughs> and I don't know. Like, as a kid, the name Pussy Galore sounded funny to me, but apparently it's a double entendre or something. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, Honor Blackman, um, the theory I have is they went to Honor Blackman and said, we'd like you to be in an episode. And Honor Blackman, who is this person? Like, she I've kind ne- of plays herself. I've never seen her be anything but this person. <laughs> yeah. Says to them, okay, as long as I either get killed right away in a spectacular death or I'm the murderer. And they went, done. Done. <laughs> well, I, I can understand. I mean, she's a big name. She's an important actress. She's got a long history. But she was also, you know, playing kind of bit parts at this point in her career. Yeah. And... um just after this, made one of my favorite movies. Yes. Cockneys versus Zombies. Which is fantastic. But not, you know, a big doorbuster movie. No, it's not a doorbuster <laughs> movie. <laughs> but if you haven't seen it, you should. <laughs> it's on Amazon, I think. I think it's on Prime. So you can watch it for free if you've got Prime. Yes, and uh, yeah, it is on Prime, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep. So she slaps that lady. She, <laughs> she, Margaret and her are having a fight, and Margaret Seagrove uh, basically is hysterical, oh. according to Honor. And so Honor Blackman slaps her. Let's be fair; a lot of people probably wanted to slap Margaret. Yes, but Isabel Hewitt is the first person to do it. So that's Honor Blackman's character's name is Isabel. Yeah. Right? And the doctor offers to drive her home after she gives the slap up. And of course, Margaret Seagrove is completely beside herself that somebody laid a hand on her. <laughs> Just, oh, 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 oh. She's flabbergasted. Just absolutely flabbergasted. Suddenly, giant moon. <laughs> the reason they're fighting is that there have been weighted flies found on the river, right? Yes. 
So this is a fly fishing episode. I know nothing about fly fishing. Well, I fell into that black hole. Okay. Okay. Because I wanted to know, like, how bad is this thing that they're accusing her of? What's the big deal? Yes. So this stretch of river that the fly fishing club gets to fish is yes. owned by a lord who we never see. Never see him. Never. No. Nope. They missed an opportunity. There. Maybe he's the real killer. Could be. <laughs> And they have a lease, right? So they pay the Lord for access to this stream, to this stretch of the stream. Yes. And Margaret is saying somebody has been fishing with weighted flies. Yes. And that's Cheaty McCheaterson. Apparently. And if the Lord found out, he might revoke their lease. He might not. I revoke your lease. He might not renew it. Yes. (laughs) What? What? So I was like, how bad is that? What is that about, right? Yeah. So I looked into UK fly fishing tournament rules. Yes. Oh, wow. This is a deep hole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that was where I finally found my answer. I watched a lot of intro to fly fishing videos. I'm sorry. Because I grew up with a fisherman. Yes. My dad's a fisherman, but he's a real fisherman. He's a real fisherman. R-E-E-L. He uses reels. He is not corporal. Yes. <laughs> well, he is corporal, but... <laughs> So I didn't know much about fly fishing. So in fly fishing, rather than using very lightweight line and a heavy lure, yes, you use heavy line and a light lure. Okay, so it kind of dances in the water. The idea is that it hits the water with nary a disturbance to the surface of the water and then sinks a certain amount when the feathers get wet mm-hmm. and it imitates a nymph. That makes sense. Right? Which is... Like um, the tadpole version of a fly. Little bug. Right. Somewhere between a larvae and a full-blown like a dragonfly is a nymph in the middle, right? So it should just go just below the surface Mm -hmm. of the water and the fish sees it and nom, 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 right? This is, I I swear, I have a point here. The speed at which- I'm with you. The speed at which the nymph sinks below the water is key, right? So you need it to go a certain depth and kind of quickly- before you snag it back out and throw it back in again, because it's supposed to be like, ha ha, here's here's something you could eat. Oh, it's gone. Here's yeah. something you could eat. Oh, it's gone. Right. Uh, so you want you want the fish to like jump on it. So you want it to sink fairly quickly, but when it hits the water, it shouldn't make a big splash. Ah, there's the rub right okay. there. Right. Because if I'm a fishy, am I attracted to the splash? No, you're scared of it Uh, because a nymph wouldn't make a big splash, right? But a big weighted fly, skablonk, into the water. So it should hit the water and then slowly sink as it gets wet and... Like a leaf going on the water. Like a nymph. Yeah. In the water. So... This is riveting podcast. (laughs) I know, but it it makes some of the episode make more sense. I agree. I've already learned something. Okay. so. So it's acceptable to put... What they call like these mini, mini, they're split beads, right? So if you imagine a little lead sphere with a split in it, yeah, you slide your line onto it and you kind of clamp it on. Yeah, I remember those as a kid. You squeeze it on and it adds microns of weight to the end of the line, Okay, right? And that makes it sink just a little bit faster, Okay, right? Or a little bit more accurately. Yeah. But we're talking about like a 20th of an ounce. Yes. Okay. And you put that like six inches above your fly. Okay. So it never goes in the water. All no. it does is help help your fly get to where you want it to go. And it sort of speeds it up getting in the water. Okay. That is acceptable. Okay. What's not acceptable is putting a heavier weight or lots of those little beads down near your fly. Okay. Because what it would do is sort of, it wouldn't only like thwack the water, but it sort of thwacks the fish. Oh, I can see that. Okay. Because this is a ball of feathers with a great big hook in it. Now now I want to look at back at the scene where Margaret finds the weighted lure and see if it's actual weighted lure. The one she finds is not even related to fly fishing. Okay, good. Okay. It is like a treble hook fishing lure that you would use with a reel okay like that's a that's a lure you would have to drag through the water by slowly reeling it in to make it even look like something that belonged in the water that a fish would want to eat Uh, it's completely unrelated to fly fishing okay at least the red one that looks like a big fish that she finds in the bushes yeah yeah it's bad okay so whoever wrote this episode you know who wrote the episode yeah um knew just enough about fly fishing 
to be able to pick up on something that would have been slightly unsportsmanlike. David Hoskins wrote this episode. But then in execution, the props they used kind of showed that somebody didn't know what they were talking about. Well, it's a really complicated thing. It is. So. And it's, so I was doing all this Googling like weighted flies, unsportsmanly, uh, weighted nymphs, rule breaking, you know, like I'm trying to figure out like how bad is this thing that Margaret is so worked up about? Like, is she irrational? Is she, is she like crazy as a bell ringer? Yeah. Or is she like legitimately upset? It's like somebody using a sniper scope when they're hunting, you know, oh, okay. like that's cheaty. It's cheaty. You know, it's It's legitimately cheaty. Yeah. And I didn't know whether she was like legitimately upset or not. And it's a matter of degrees. Okay. Is, is the bottom line. That's the, the boring end of the story. It's a matter of degrees. And certainly nobody who we see legitimately fly fishing in the episode is doing what she's accusing them of. Okay. There you go. There we go. Now you know. Now we know. It does not make the episode make any more sense to me to have that answer. No, there's lots of problems with the episodes. Because I still don't know how the killer managed to do what he did. Oh, there's problems. Yeah. So, But a bookmobile. But lots of fun, too. Yeah, a bookmobile. Driving around the countryside, lurking. (laughs) How does Cully end up in a bookmobile? Uh, Where is Cully's boyfriend? I thought she was living in London. Isn't she an actress? These are the questions. How come she's in love with Troy now? Like, all these questions. Well, she said she got kind of roped into volunteering to put together the the photo show. Yes. And and that I buy because she is Joyce's daughter. Yeah. Which means she's going to end up involved in all kinds of committees. And, and probably people are going to die because of it. But yeah, anyway, but the bookmobile, that's a job. Yeah. Like, is Cully living at home now or does she have a place? I don't know. She's got a car. I don't know. But well, t- she's got Sally's car. Yes. Right. <laughs> the car that she drives is Sally's car from Tainted Fruit. Yeah. It's the same car. And uh, it's she calls it Birdie, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah. I like that car, though. It's a cool car, but she also has a bookmobile. I would drive that thing around. Okay, I I had a weird question when I saw the first saw the bookmobile, and I saw Cully was in charge of the bookmobile. I'm like, does she have a license to drive that? <laughs> what kind of license do you need to drive a bookmobile? Do you need like an RV license? And or I, and it's I, big. I stopped because I said to myself, I don't need to go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. Though it can't be easy because a lot of the lanes that you see in the episodes are barely wide enough for like a car and a half. Well, you need a little red sports car to and drive And that thing's down giant. They should have had the bookmobile on the old uh, Out of the airfield. airfield. <laughs> yeah, going around the corner on two wheels. So we've got, uh, right off the bat, we've got Isabel Hewitt. We've got Margaret Seagrove. We've got Margaret's husband, Derek. Derek. We've got Andrew, the real estate agent, driving around. Leo Bantock, who's come back to town. Yep. You know, they do a really good job of just kind of laying out mm-hmm. all of the main characters right off the bat. And what am I obsessed with? A sign in the cop shop, which reads, we're looking from, for some extra special constables. And unfortunately, the rest of the sign is unreadable. Believe you me. I tried to read it. So what's an extra special constable? What are we looking for them <laughs> for? Are they hiding? Is it special blue uh, white stick brigade? <laughs> <laughs> they're the um, midsummer fly fishers. Yes. So they're off to see the jaguar owning pensioner. Yes. Because Margaret comes to complain. <gasps> she struck me. I've been assaulted. She wasn't provoked. Even if she was, she still hit you, I guess. Would you, if somebody slapped you, would you go to the police? I intend to press charges. Would you do that? The, the problem is I hate Margaret the character and like Margaret the actress. Yeah. I wish she was in more stuff in the episode. Yeah. But I don't like her character. Well, yeah, she's kind of unlikable. Yeah. Uh, which is why I went down the fly fishing hole because I was looking for I was looking for justification to either dislike her because she's obsessed about something unimportant or like her because she was legitimately upset. Yeah. I, I needed to know which of that, which path I should take. But in the end, it didn't matter because I don't like Isabel at all. I don't like Isabel. I don't like Margaret. But hey, there's Rebecca. True. <laughs> 
Rebecca and Melrose are Isabel's niece and nephew, and they are... They're uh, the Plunkets. Yeah. Like, they got nowhere to go with the name, like, Plunkett. Yeah. And Mel- Melrose Plunkett? Melrose is so... Uh, like, grow a chin, man. Like, and Rebecca is just the most irritating person. And needs a haircut oh, so bad. so desperately. She looks like a sheepdog in that hair. She's, I don't know what's up with that. She's like... I know. Let's put her in bad Joyce hair. <laughs> and, and give her really bad outfits that are really frumpy and mousy looking. Yeah. And well, they can't keep on paying Isabel's overdraft. You know, Rebecca may be bitchy, but if I was in Rebecca's position, I think I would be kind of bitchy too. Isabel's been taking them for a ride for years. And she's a jerk. She is mean to people. She's yeah. a bully. Yeah, but she's pretty, so she's got away with it. Yeah, and that's totally implied, and I don't like that. No, I don't either. And and I don't like that Isabel plays stupid either. Well, she'll get Quentin to help. He is one of those calculator things. Quentin Roca of Roca Antiques. Then, out of nowhere, Leo shows up and gives her uh, 20 grand. Yeah, Leo Bantock. Now, let me tell you something here. Yeah. So, Leo is played by James Hazeldine, Mm -hmm. who's an actor and has acted in some stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's what actors do. <laughs> Thanks for vigging it up for <laughs> me there. You. You're welcome. <laughs> the most interesting thing about him, though, James Hazeldine, in terms of Midsummer, is that his actual son, Sam Hazeldine, yes. his real life son, not his son in the episode. He doesn't have a son in the episode. No, no. The actor's son. Because him and Ruth never got together. Not yet. <laughs> Too uh-huh. late now. Yeah. Anyway, James Hazeldine, the actor who plays Leo Bantock, his son, Sam Hazeldine, goes on to play Simon Dixon, who marries Cully. Wow. So Leo is kind of Cully's imaginary father-in-law. Imaginary. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the guy who works with the rock and roll band. Outfit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The guy, the guy, not the actor, who guy. she marries in the wedding episode. Yes, is James Hazeldine's real son. Oh, well, that that's nice that they have that little crossover. So there you go. You got to wait for uh, five more seasons to see that, um, but that's what happens. The library truck looms in the background. <laughs> so Quentin sees everything, and Isabel comes over and says the thing that made us freak out after the episode. Yeah. So let's talk about Quentin and Isabel's relationship. Oh, yes. by the way, Quentin's the killer. He's the killer. Okay. Quentin killer. But he's also Isabel's best friend, supposedly. Supposedly. Or her poodle. It depends, right? He <laughs> sees Rebecca and Melrose leave Isabel's house in a huff. He knows there's been some drama. He likes the drama. So he hustles over to Isabel's to find out Closes what's going shop, on. Closes the shop, hustles over. To get the scoop. Well, no, she pulls up in the car. No, when he walks up to the front of her house, she's getting in the car. Oh, that's right. So he jumps in and they go for the ride. Yes. Down at the airfield. And then she She's says, already got a picnic packed and everything. Then she says the thing. She says that she just got the evil witch Rebecca off her back. Time to so celebrate. If she says that, she must be implying that her getting the money from Leo has made it easier for her to live with Rebecca. Right. This contradicts an important plot point later in the episode. You mean the entire plot? Yes. Like Quentin's entire reason for killing her? The whole thing. Is that he doesn't know that she doesn't own her house and doesn't know that she doesn't have money? Guess what? He does know. Otherwise, why would Rebecca be on her back? And the scenes with them feel genuine. They seem to get along and be buddies. I know she might call him a poodle to one of her friends, but I don't think she meant it. No. I think think she she legitimately likes Quentin. Quentin everything. Yeah. He nursed her back from the dead. Especially because it means that they could be catty about Rebecca. Exactly. Which seems like something that they would want to do together. But without him knowing that Melrose and Rebecca are covering some of her debts, they don't have that much reason to be catty about her. So this whole idea that Quentin didn't know about her financial situation, it just doesn't make any sense. bunk. From right off the bat, it doesn't make any sense. Never mind his alibi, which is the part that I don't get. Let's get on to the important stuff. The signs on the side of the bookmobile. (laughs) What did you see? (laughs) So, signs on the side of the bookmobile include the following. So, they're in a little hemmed-in kind of bulletin board. There's one on each side of both doors. There's doors on both sides of the bookmobile. I can only see one of these bulletin boards. Okay. Okay. So, just 
to be careful. These are like community announcements that yes. are posted on the sign of the bookmobile. The first thing, it, and it has glass over top of it and a little lock. Um, well, the, you wouldn't want anybody to steal one of those Well, somebody flyers. could change one of the flyers or something. <gasps> so in there, predominantly, right now, is your village, which is a celebration of photographs at the village of Malin Bridge, sponsored by Andrew Turner, a state agent. Right. And that's the thing that Cully's doing. That's the thing that Cully's doing, right? But there's more. (laughs) So, first of all, this bookmobile has Oxfordshire all over it. Yeah. I have no doubt they borrowed it from Oxfordshire. Right. Right. They also have bank uh, bank holiday library closings. Okay. For non British people, bank holidays are Monday holidays in the summer so that you have a holiday uh, long weekend every weekend in the summer. I think they have them in some other. Times of the year in Britain, but in Canada, that's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. So we have long holidays. Then they have a thing that says, why don't you use the library service? Which was weird. But then they have this music making for everyone, basically program on at the library. Okay. I have dates. (laughs) April 10th, 2002 is classical guitar. April 27th, clarinet, flute, oboe, and jazz saxophone. May 11th, the String Workshop. May 18th, the Academy Workshop, which I don't know. May 25th, Jazz. May, June 15th, Folk. And June 22nd, Early Music. I'm impressed that they can teach you how to play an instrument and play one of those kinds of music in just one session. Yes, but wait, there's more. Oh. There's also a sign, as best as I can tell, for something called Hattrick. Okay. And Hattrick is the library's information system. Not so- hat. Trick. It's all one word. I think it's hat trick. Two T's? I don't know because I did go down the hole of Oxfordshire library <laughs> information <laughs> systems and I could not find anything related to this. You are a sick man. <laughs> <laughs> you went to see what their card catalog software was called? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> And it's not called Hat Trick? No, but it may have at one time. Okay. (laughs) Uh, The old lady who comes in the bookmobile has a book called Red Barbarian. I couldn't find that book. I have no idea what it means. I don't know why it's called Red Barbarian, but I want to know. I bet you it's one of those Conan novels that that old lady's reading. And I read a woman with red, like, robes on Ooh the la cover. La. So, yep. Uh, so Kelly's collecting pictures for this thing, and a couple of them uh, have... VE celebrations and Dixie Goff, the doctor's wife. Uh, so ignore the ones of my sculptures. I like her sculptures. They're fun. I would be happy to have one of those rabbits yep. in my house. They're crazy. They got big buggy eyes. But to be fair, so does she. Yes. <laughs> she has kind of buggy eyes. If only the rabbits were wearing gigantic earrings. <laughs> like she like does. Like her. So out to the airbase, the abandoned airbase, and we have what I think is the first crane shot in Midsummer. I agree. So the car... No, I take that back. Tainted fruit. We've got that aerial shot of the roof and the rain and all that stuff. That may be a crane shot. That might be a crane shot, too. Nowadays, it would be a drone shot. I'll tell you what we have. We have two separate people driving this car. (laughs) Yes! (laughs) (laughs) We have... We have Quentin and Isabel in the car on the close-ups having fun. They're yes. enjoying themselves. More than that, though, we have the two incredibly joyful stuntmen driving the car in the long shots. One of them has a scarf wrapped around his head. Yes. And the other one has Quentin's hat. And they are laughing They're hysterically. joyful and they're burly. Yes, they're much bigger. <laughs> it's like in the episode with uh, Punch and Judy when the, the two ladies are driving the van. Yes. And in reality, it may it's, be the same it's, guys. it's two stunt guys and they're having fun, but they are rather large compared to the actresses <laughs> that they're replacing. So I can imagine a conversation, hey, Joe, do you want to be Isabel or do you want to be? No, that scarf might mess up my hair. Okay, on, there okay. we go. <laughs> Let's go drive on that airport. That is a nice car. That is a super nice car. I would be happy to drive that car. That's a nice Jag. So back in the pub, we have three people who shouldn't be talking to each other, talking to each other. Leo, Derek, and Keith. Yes. And Leo 
comes in. Of course, he and Keith are at it hammer and tongs right away because they're both in love with Ruth. Because Keith Ruth, is now married to. Yeah, Ruth dated Leo, and then Leo left to do his biz- business, his business in the big city. And and Leo gets back at Keith by going, "Well, I heard she had an affair with Duncan." Yeah. Okay. Now he's talking about the woman that he loves too, right? Yeah, like it's kind of well, I love her, but she's a slag. Yeah. That's like, weird. Yeah. When uh, when you first see the episode, you don't know that Leo is in love with Ruth. And so it's like he's just getting back at Keith for whatever it is that they have a beef about. But once you know that they are actually in love with the same woman, for him to throw it back at Keith that his wife is having an affair, that doesn't make any sense to me. Oh. But it makes a little bit more sense to me than the whole deal with Duncan. Well, Duncan's an elderly man, but he's nice. Okay. Duncan Goff is not only elderly, he's ugly. And nice. He is the ugliest Lothario I've ever seen. But Ruth says he's nice. <laughs> he's geriatric. And nice. He's got some kind of mojo That's going on. That's like the worst reason to have an affair ever. He was nice. I've met a lot of nice men, and I have not slept with them. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'm sure you're glad to hear it. There's an 80-year-old guy who lives a few doors down. He's really nice, too. Okay. I'm not tempted. And he's a doctor. Yes, and I'm not tempted. No. Okay? (laughs) But I'll tell you something about Duncan, though. So Duncan's played by Richard Durden. And we've talked about how some actors who are um, not extras, but they're character actors in Midsummer, have been in a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Richard Durden is the quintessential murder mystery actor. Okay. Let me read you the list of murder mystery shows he's been in. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Basically, I could say, you name one, I bet it's on the list. Here we go. (laughs) Morse. Yep. Magritte. Yep. Lovejoy. Yep. Foyle's War. Yep. Rosemary and Time. Yep. Marple. Yep. Poirot. Yep. Lewis. Yep. The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher. Yep. Agatha Raisin. Why have we not watched The Suspicions we of Mr. Witcher? We have. Yes. Is, is Mr. Witcher different than The Witcher? Yes. That would be a crossover. The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher is about a policeman. Okay. And The Witcher is a guy who fights monsters. Yes. Okay. Agatha Raisin. Yes. And Endeavor. Okay. What so, about The Bill? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So he's been in... Morse, Lewis, and Endeavor. So he's the he's the only other one then. I think because so. Because Thursday's been in all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you know he's he's not super attractive, and <laughs> he's kind of old. But wow, he's, he's been busy. around. He's a busy dude. He's a busy dude. He um in Agatha Raisin he played Mister Boggle, who's the husband of the old lady who's so awesome, and then he dies, and then she's oh, yeah. even more awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, he was also in Jonathan Strange and Mister Norrell. Which, if you haven't read or seen, you should. One yeah. or the other, both. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, Richard Durden, hats off to him. Man, he's a busy boy. And I don't think he's ever been a victim until now. Oh, well, he gets his head bashed in here because yeah, he's he an idiot. Yeah. Here, let me um, lean down in front of the person who still has the bloody weapon in their hand and make myself vulnerable. But hmm. we're getting ahead of ourselves. Anyway. There's Cully and, and Troy love to happen. I, it comes out of nowhere. Just like running across the fields with their arms open. Like, oh. He gets out of the car. She sees him from inside the library mobile. And she's like, oh, Gavin. It's Gavin. She's never been like that before. No. No. And isn't like that later when they're sitting outside the pub talking. It's no. like, that's just past. Okay. They're having a picnic on the field. Yeah. Right? And... Uh, they're drinking champagne. These two people who apparently keep important secrets to e- from each other, who are laughing and joyful. Yes. Okay. And she says, it's the Rosers. <laughs> Which is kind of fun. So do you know why they're called Rosers? Mm-mm. Okay. The accepted explanation is it's a punny, pi- a punny play on Sir Robert Peel. Oh, yeah. That's why they called them Peelers. And Bobby's. Yeah. So Bobby's, Peeler's, Rosers all come from the same name. Where does Roser come from? It's Peel? a mispronunciation of Robert. Oh. So they could have called him Robbies. Robbies. Or Bobs. Dobbies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the other thing. 
Poberts. <laughs> and in fact, here she says, you can do this in front of Quentin because we have no secrets. Right. Except for the great big one that's going to make him want to kill me. I guess. No. No. It's like they got Honor Blackman to agree to be in an episode and they wrote it around her and they didn't think about the plot. Yeah. It feels like that. And I love Midsummer. I'm a maniac for Midsummer, And I, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. There's stuff that happened at Jane and Duncan's house and Ruth and Keith's house. And it's all soap opera. Yes. The, the, the days of the red herring. Yes. There are lots of red herrings. Bottom line, though, is Isabel and Duncan are dead by the river. But, well, hold, hold on. What about Leo hanging outside the house? <laughs> In his car being all creepy? In his car being all creepy with another giant moon. Yes. It's the big moon that makes people kill. You don't need a reason to kill if there's a big moon. Nope. So Andrew <laughs> is fishing and he gets his line caught in a tree. Okay, I may be bad at a lot of practical things. I've been known. He's a real estate agent, not yeah. a fisherman, no, apparently. Because, he... wow, does he really get it caught. And he trips over them. Yeah. And... and and I've gotten many a line caught in a tree, okay? Yep. My dad has tried to teach me how to fish many, many, many times. And yep. I have got lines caught in trees that you wouldn't believe. I hooked my dad in the head once. Yep. It's possible. Yep. Um, less possible in fly fishing, especially a tree behind you, above and behind you. Yes. More likely to be upstream. It's not very good. Or across. No. Yeah, he's not very good. But I'll tell you what's more impossible. Hmm. Dead bodies that breathe. Yeah. Because <laughs> both of them are breathing. Honor Blackman's a great actress, but she's not a good corpse. Nope. No. So next day, scene of the crime, we found a stick. Don't forget, my f- <laughs> Troy, he has fewer favorite lines as he gets more mature and says yes. less offensive things. But he says, you never know with these wrinklies. <laughs> I love that. Because he thinks they might be at it. Yeah, they were probably at it. And then somebody bashed him on the head. Yeah, they were at it in their fishing gear. And Derek comes by and finds out what's going on and immediately realizes his wife is going to be a suspect. Well, yeah, because Isabel hit her the night before. Yes. And then we get these weird scenes with Cully and Joyce at the pub where Cully is like, well, here's some incredibly important information that I learned from Gwen the Gossip. There's two scenes where Cully and... Joyce are giving information to us, yeah. but not Barnaby. Yeah. <laughs> Key pieces of information, important information. Oh, Mar- Margaret was just doing the lures. That's all she was doing all that morning. Well, it does take a while to try tie a fly. And, Barnaby- and I can tell you one thing I know now about fly fishing that I didn't know before. What's that? It's not for me because, man, and that is some tedious shit. That is some tedious <laughs> Tying those there. flies is insane. Barnaby goes, tells the Plunkets, and they're like, oh, oh well, we own everything anyway. Yeah, Rebecca's immediately like, okay, so we're going to have to clear the house out. and We'll have a very small funeral. We'll give her like two bottles of wine. That's it. Only four people are going to show up anyway. And da 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 And yep. off they go. So then Andrew tells Quentin. And again, Quentin acts stunned. Mm-hmm. And incredibly upset. It's great acting. The actor is acting well. Yeah. As a, an actor. Yes. He's being an actor. Yes, because he did it. <laughs> he plays Quentin acting surprised. And this is the first scene, I think, that we noticed that fob in his lapel. Yes. You asked about that. I looked that up. He, um, the sports jacket he wears has a lapel buttonhole which in the UK they call boutonniere. In the US, we call a boutonniere the flower that you put in that hole, but they call that hole the boutonniere. Okay. And so what he's done is he's taken a fob watch that you would normally wear as a pocket watch on your waistcoat. And put it in And he's put the fob in his lapel buttonhole and put it in his pocket. Okay. Which uh, is not a thing to do. Oh, okay. So the few places where I could find references to doing that were on bespoke tailoring sites where they said, don't. Oh. That it's hoity-toity and basically just says, I'm so proud of having my bling that I'm going to put it higher up on my body so that you notice it because I'm so pretentious that I think if I put it in my waistcoat or if I just put it in my pants pocket, maybe you might not see it. So along with being a a wonderful friend, a, a helper, a confidant, he's also Ponzi. Yes. Which is weird. Yes. It's 
you know, and this is my least liked murderer. He struck me as gay from the st- beginning on. Yeah. The fact that they then reveal that he's in love with Isabel. Like, but he can be in love with her and still be gay, but I don't think he's gay. No. He has the relationship with the other woman who dies of cancer, too. Yeah. No, that was his mom. No, no. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. It wasn't his mom. It was no. a, an, another elderly lady. Yeah. But the the they're saying something about him by putting that pocket watch. It's kind of like, I'm I, it's sort of fake. The gay antique dealer boy toy, as uh, Troy calls it. He's a poodle. Yes. <laughs> So we find out that Dr. Goff was locked out. Do you think that old man could climb a ladder up to his window? uh, No, I don't. I don't think so either. Plus she says I didn't lock him out. Well, yeah, you did. (laughs) Well, he just forgot his key at home and I locked the door. Knowing his key was inside. (laughs) Who was he sneaking around with? I don't know. uh... Because he's not sleeping around with Ruth anymore. No, he's not. That was years ago. So who in the village is he sleeping with now? Someone in desperate need of a nice man. I guess. So at Quentin's house, we have a a bunch of red herring stuff that happens. But back at Quentin's job, where he runs the antique store, when Barnaby and Troy come to talk to him, at first he's talking to Customer. Mm-hmm. That's his only name. Yes. The guy, the guy who wants a better price and he won't give it to him. So he yes. leaves. So this is where he gives the story of the pneumonia and him driving like an Edwardian governess. Yeah. And then another big problem. So he says he has an alibi, that he was at the shop at 10 o'clock. And I can only guess that this was confirmed by other people. Yeah, it is confirmed by other people. So how could he be killing them while at the shop? I don't know. It, You know, it's like the... The episode has Keith as the actual killer. And then at the last minute, they said, what if it's Quentin? Well, shouldn't we go back and fix all that stuff? No. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, exactly. Because they narrow down the window when Isabel and Duncan were killed to like 30 minutes. And Andrew's on one side of them fishing and Derek's on the other side of them fishing. Yeah. I mean, a ways up and down the stream. Yeah. And so they narrow it way down and... Quentin was Quentin, at, the the ninja was at the shops at a quarter after ten, and Gwen, the village gossip, confirms it. Yeah. So how is he the killer? I don't know. Well, you know why he killed him. He saw Isabel kill a fish. Yes. Oh, you mean you can kill things by hitting them on the head? I'm gonna try it. <laughs> there's. Oh, it worked. I'm no, gonna do it again. I no don't understand motive. it. There's no. He has an alibi. I don't understand. How they did it. But I do understand that when Keith and Leo are in the fight that they have, there's something very interesting going on. What? And that is the little kids in the background. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So there's two kids in the background, and there's a whole little story around them. Yeah. They they have fishing rods. They're watching. They have fishing rods. They're getting into the fight. And their mother comes along and says, we should go, and moves them over by a sign. That says, children's area. Yes. Or something. (laughs) It's like it's like they know that fights are going to happen and kids should stay 25 feet away from the fights. Yes. You know, like this is the safety zone for children. Those two little boys are not happy about getting pulled away from the old man fight, though. They were enjoying the old man fight. I'm sorry. It's Keith's mom who died of cancer. Yes. And he blames Duncan for it. Which uh, there was something I didn't like about that also. That that Duncan is a, a GP and wouldn't have been treating cancer? Well, there there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and it couldn't be his fault. Maybe yeah. maybe it was her oncologist they might want to blame. Maybe. Keith is a fraught character. Yeah, he is. He's married to a woman who is disappointed that she married him and he knows it. And so he's a restauranter. He's a cook. He runs a restaurant. It's called uh, whatever their last name is. Yeah. He's just... Scholey. Dis- or Scully. Scully. He's just disagreeable the whole time. He's a grump. Yeah. And he's like, how dare you talk to my wife? Don't talk to my wife. He treats her like an object, yeah. like a, a possession, especially at Isabel's funeral. He's really, he's a bully and a jerk. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't blame her for not wanting to be with him. So Dixie, who is Dr. Goff's wife, has a great line that comes in here when, she, when Troy notices that she's a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, fish aren't vegetables. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, so I guess you don't eat them. <laughs> yeah. 
Even though you got a freezer full of them because your husband kept catching them. Oh, those weird, the, the basement scenes with Dixie are a whole other 10 minute conversation because she acts as guilty as possible in those scenes. Oh, I don't think so. I think she's like sisters are doing it for themselves. Ah. She's like, that man's gone. Good riddance. Speaking of good riddance, Isabel has an obituary. It's quite the obituary. Oh my gosh. Let me guess. You read every word of it. Every single <laughs> word of it. It must have been weird for Honor Blackman to basically see her own obituary before when she, she was died. When like, yeah. she died, like, only would... a few years later. Yeah. So it says, uh, it's in the register. Um, the pictures are pussy galore pictures. Of course they are. And race driver, aviator, diplomat. 1927 to 2002. It is quite the obituary. Usually in these contexts, right, it has filler text. Yeah, lorem ipsum or something. Oh, but not this obituary. They had some fun, including a paragraph in the last column, which reads the following. Wearing her victory garlands with breathtaking style, Isabel took once more to the air and flew across the Pacific to California, where she stood where her star proceeded to shine just as brightly in the halcyon days of Hollywood. <laughs> wow, somebody liked writing that. <laughs> it just makes me think of the um, the voiceover for the old newsreels. Yeah, and absolutely. He, and here's Isabel Hewitt. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> that sort of thing. Look at her go in her aeroplane. So we haven't covered this one thing, which is the poacher. A couple of things. One, at one point in time, Derek is out at night worried about the poacher. And the poacher can be clearly seen in the background. He must be like waving, right? And then Derek's about to be like the poacher is coming up. And we don't know if it's a murderer or the poacher. But guess what? It's the poacher. And he, Who's he, the former gamekeeper? James Tapsell. Yeah, And he's going to come up to Derek, about to come up to Derek. And then a disembodied voice that is never identified says, Derek, aren't you coming to the pub? And then Derek goes to the pub. That's James Tapsell talking to him, trying to lure him away. Really? Yes. I don't think so. He pops his little balaclava head up from the bush and goes, Derek, want to come to the pub? <laughs> and then he ducks back down again. Derek looks around. Head comes up again. Derek, are you coming to the pub or what? And then he ducks back down again. And Derek's like, well, I guess I better go to the pub. So Derek and the estate agent in the next scene at night are ready. I'll pick you up at nine. They're ready. Let's go. Okay. They're, they're, they're dun, prepared. Dun, 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 dun. And there's a fight. And this is a really good fight. Like, there's punching. Mm, yeah. But Not it's... like the slap fight of the old man earlier. <laughs> well, it's two against one. Yes. And he kicks their asses. He does indeed kick their asses. Though, he's a big burly guy, and they're two fly fishermen. Yes. But you, we've skipped over something really important. What did we skip over? We've skipped over Isabel's funeral. Oh, oh, sorry. We, we did both the poacher scenes, but yeah, we, I, I meant to just do the first poacher scene. Because we can't not talk about Paragon Slade. The best part of this episode is Isabel's funeral. <laughs> Absolutely. Which I had completely forgotten about, and it drops out of nowhere, and it's just awesome. It's like a little present in the middle of this episode that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So Melrose and his evil wife show up at the funeral, and they think it's just going to be like three people. Yeah. But oh no. Oh no. There's tall African-American guys. They're Af African-African guys. Diplomats from all over the world. Women diplomats. in saris. And, yep. Yep. And the man with the oysters. Yes. Disgraced former minister, uh, foreign ministers. Yes. Actresses. Now, Margaret does something smart here. She goes fishing. She stays out of the way. So Peregrine Slade introduces himself to Melrose and his wife. And this is my manservant, Hastings. Hastings. We'll He's put eager out to help. A couple of bottles of bubbly. It's her favorite. There are six cases in the back of the Verve car. Verve Kluck. Verve Kluck. It is quite the party. Peregrine Slade is played by Peter Sellier. Okay. Who I thought, this is going to be one of those actors when you look him up and you find out he's actually like a baron or something. Something like right? that, yeah. Not quite. Okay. But he is the great nephew 
of Arthur Sullivan, as in Gilbert and Sullivan. Oh, wow. He has listened to some Gilbert and Sullivan. Yes. And... Because he's got a stage presence, this, like, a, like he's a stage actor. This role that he plays in this, yeah. that is the part that he plays and he, always plays. Rich, happy, funny, fancy, boisterous guy. Very fancy. Fancy, fun, boisterous guy. Remains of the day. Yep. Oh, yeah. Howard's End. Oh, my gosh. That's right. He's in both of those. Chariots of Fire. Yeah. Barry Lyndon. Yeah. I looked at his IMDb listing. He is Sir something as the role he's playing 37 times. 37 (laughs) times? 37 times he's played Sir something. Well, we need a rich guy. We need somebody who is aristocratic. Yeah. It's that He fills the slot. Absolutely. And like another dozen where he plays the honorable judge, whatever, yeah. magistrate, whatever. He's, like when he was eight, he was probably yeah. Lord whatever. But he did so well in this. Oh, he's so good. The oyster man tells a great story about Isabel and yep. her husband saving them. And then he Peregrine gives this speech where he says inbreds and hayseeds mm-hmm. and no one is insulted. And nope. yet he is insulting them. He does it so well. Because it's one of those, like, if you're who I'm talking about, you won't know it. Yes. Because, well, you're what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, he says that. He says, like, lords and ladies and ministers and former ministers. Sorry, John. Yeah. Like, he is so charming. Yeah. And then he says that the, he, she had lost touch with the city folk but we never forgot her. And Izzy had a talent for life. Like when when I die, have this guy come and do the eulogy. (laughs) It almost makes me think that Isabel Hewitt was a better person when her husband was alive. I think so. That together they were awesome. But now that he's gone, she's a brat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I don't think people would talk about her in that way. If she was who she was in the episode, her whole life. I can see that. You know? I don't know. So there's all this red herring stuff that goes on here at yeah, the party. Yeah, the big fighting. There's crap. fighting and stuff like that. One thing I did like was Mel Rose and his wife in the background of one of the scenes just screaming at each other. Yeah, they're out on the lawn. Yeah. And then you get the scene of um, Ruth and is it Derek she's talking to? She's saying, I don't think Keith's alibi holds up. Yes. Yeah, so so there, there's a couple of scenes where there are people outside the window having conversations that are kind of important, that you don't yes. hear the conversation, but you see them talking. Yeah, but, wow. And, and Peregrine Slade is an awesome name. Yes, and this whole thing about Quentin's ex-partner and the woman that he used to live with, and it's all just crap. And then... Barnaby and Troy go to find somewhere where they can gossip without being disturbed. Mm -hmm. And they walk into a room, which they could clearly see Dixie, and they pretend not to see Dixie. Yeah, even though she's over there on the floor. Like you would easily be able to see her. Tom says that Quentin is straight as a die. Yes. I wasn't sure about that, because I've heard straight as an arrow. Yes. But not straight as a die. Yeah. So I looked it up, and according to the OED, it's a reference to gaming dice. Oh. Being true, being square. And being, like, not, um, not loaded. weighted. Right. Not loaded. Not loaded. But it fell out of favor, because so many people made cheaty dice yeah. that weren't true. Ah, uh. And so then it became straight as an arrow and other things, the reference. So the fact that he calls him straight as a die and he's the killer is actually kind of accurate twice. He thinks he is straight and honest, but he's not. And neither are dice. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think they meant to do that, but it's clever. And then Quentin tries to like double up his alibi saying, uh, not only... Was I not at the river when Isabel and Derek were killed? I was at the store, but I also stopped by the restaurant. Yeah. Why does he even say that? Because he wants to frame Keith so that when he kills Keith, it looks like Keith is the killer. Why is he killing Keith? I, like, to Barnaby goes, he kills Keith because Keith could have said that he didn't do it. Keith was guilty on paper already. Yeah, like if they'd gone to court with Quentin and Keith both as suspects, Keith would have gone down. I would have. Quentin has an alibi. If I'm a jury member, I'm like, Keith, 
You're guilty. Yeah. And then Troy comes out with a better plot than the actual plot. Oh my. Okay. So first of all, Keith dies. Dies in the freezer. There's all sorts of problems with this. All right. He, oh, it's he's dead in the fridge. First of all, vital, important thing. It's a fridge, not a freezer. So well, you don't die. No. Why is he eating chicken wings? <laughs> And half eating them. He like takes a bite out of it like a three-year-old and then sets it down. Maybe it's because it's pitch black in there and he can't find it again. Why does so he, he just take grabs his shoes another off? one? Why does he take his shoes off? Um, when you get hypothermia, you get this um, a crazy impulse to disrobe. We're is lucky that, he's not naked. Is that also a thing that you throw the phone into a bottle of bucket of water? Yeah. Oh, okay. When it doesn't work, that's what you do. It's funny because I used to work in a grocery store with one of these fridges and I paused the show and wrote a whole bunch of notes about fridges have fail saves and this could never happen. And then I started the show and Barnaby said everything that I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a freezer, it would be completely different. Yes. Right? We could believe that he actually died. I don't think you would die in a fridge. Nowhere. Nowhere. In the entire country of England, is there a health and safety man who is going to allow a padlock on a fridge like that? No. Health and safety is going to come in and go, no. And why would you do it anyway? To protect the vegetables. (laughs) I got a bucket of celery in there. It's real valuable. I don't want anybody to take it. (laughs) I will tell you one thing. Troy is right. It's a little expensive for half lobster, but that... Menu is, looks really good. It does look good. I'd eat there. Yeah, they, they did a great job making it look good, too. Yeah, I wouldn't eat there after there's a dead guy in the fridge. No. But, but th- this is like Troy's shining moment. There should be like a sunbeam on him and Angel should go, oh. Because he comes up with a better reason for Keith to be in the fridge than anyone else, including Quentin, who killed him. Yeah. And how did go? Okay, so Quentin goes over. Okay, I'm, I'm Keith. I'm chopping the vegetables. Right. Right. And Quentin comes in. Hi, how are you doing? I'm okay. Look at my fob watch. Okay. <laughs> I have a straw boater. Okay. okay. <laughs> Let me just go into the fridge here for a second. In that moment, we are expected to believe that bringing a nail. No, no, no. They say that Quentin had rigged the door previously. Oh, so he was like standing talking to him. And then how did he get in the restaurant? To do that. I don't know. He snuck in the back door. It's not padlocked. <laughs> <laughs> so many problems with this. Yeah. So he's like, someday I may want to frame Keith as the killer. So I'll wedge a nail in this door just in case I ever need to trap him. And in if the you've fridge. ever worked in a restaurant, you go in and out of the fridge like crazy. Yeah. So uh, there's just so many problems here. So are we supposed to think that Keith put the phone in the water? I don't know. Or that... Quentin did. I don't know. Like, I can see if Quentin's trying to frame him. Because Keith is conscious in the fridge. Yeah. When the door is locked. Right. I can see that Quentin threw the phone in to make it look like it was a fake suicide attempt, which is the thing that Troy figures out and threw it in the carrot water intentionally so he couldn't use the phone. Right. But there's lead in the door, so Superman can't get in and the phone can't get out except for if the phone, the door is open with the phone and the carrot vegetable soup. Well, and Quentin could only trap Keith in the fridge if Keith had gone in voluntarily and Quentin had slammed the door behind him. And he's sitting there like he's like, oh, well, I guess I'm just going to freeze to death. Wouldn't you be banging on the door? Like, Keith is a big guy. But he's in there all night. You'd get tired of banging on the door. I can understand that, but it's still not going to kill him to be in there all night. No, no, not in a fridge. You could set a little file. If it was a Sub-Zero, I would believe it. Plus, uh, you know... So he doesn't have time to throw the phone in after him? No, he doesn't. And really probably doesn't have time to shut off the light. No. I can believe he could shut off the light. This is a scene in need of a reenactment, and I think they probably went, okay, well, we should film a... Well, we no, can't wait film a minute. It won't make sense. reenactment because it doesn't make any sense. It would make sense if Keith was actually the killer trying to pretend that he wasn't. Wait a minute. Let's make it Quentin. 
<laughs> but then we were missing like 20 minutes of the episode. So, hmm, I know we'll have Leo come in onto Ruth in the alley five minutes after they find her husband's body. Okay, previous episode, the question was, how long after your wife's funeral can you see your mistress? That was the question that What's-Her-Name asked the milkman. The, the farmer. The milk farmer. The, car, the right? cow farmer, yes. Right? <laughs> Apparently the answer is, not even before it's a scene of a crime. He's, I would say he's still warm, but he's in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, they haven't even brought his body out yet. And she's like making googly eyes at Leo in the, in the um, alleyway with the name of the restaurant framed between them. Yeah, yeah. Because she's always loved Leo. She's not really upset about Keith being dead. She's really not. No. Would you be? He was a jerk. Uh, And then Tom meditates in the kitchen. Mm. He puts his head on the chopping board Mm. and stares ruminatively into the refrigerator. He's thinking. He's got his thinking hat on. Mm -hmm. Normally, he would be with Joyce and Cully and have to run out in the middle of a meal. Ha! But instead, he meditates in the kitchen. Hmm. And puts it all together. Our murderers, members of Mensa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come up with a story that will make this improbable situation make sense. They're, Not- out to, they're out to dinner. Troy gives his theory, says case closed. Barnaby goes to get more drinks. And doesn't come back. And Cully says, oh, Gavin's right. <laughs> Because Tom can't solve it unless he can ditch a family social event. Yeah. That's the only time when he can come up with a solution. So then they have a 20-minute end of the episode. Because I was like, oh, he's going to see Quentin now? Well, this will be over in five minutes. Oh, no. Quentin has to tell him everything, but not explain how he did it. No. It is, that is what happens. I saw her kill a fish. So I decided to kill her. And that was your inspiration? But then we have the stupidest doctor in the world. Maybe he did let that woman die of cancer. Like she's got big growths on her. And he's like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Because he's the stupidest nice man ever. (laughs) But he's nice. Maybe he tried to cure her with niceness. So you see somebody standing over a person that you know with blood on their head. They have a stick. And it's bloody. And it's bloody. What are you going to do? And you bend down. In front of them, with your back to them. Checking. He lifts up her eyes. I was expecting Honor Blackman to go, ow! (laughs) (laughs) And he says, what have you done? Like, this is why why cops always deal with the suspect before the victim. Right. They secure the scene. They secure the scene. The the doctor, he's a nice man. He's too nice. He's stupid. He's so nice, he gets killed. Yeah. And he knows that Quentin is the one who struck her. It's not like he thinks Quentin walked up and picked up the weapon. Like, oh no, what's happened to her? Why did you pick that up? That's the murder weapon. You should have left it alone. He he says, what have you done? He knows that Quentin's the one who hit her. Yeah. But maybe, maybe doctors just, you know, their Hippocratic oath kicks in and their common sense goes out. It's just, I just... There's so many things wrong here. But Tom's nice. Tom's nice. In the end. He tells Troy that he was right both times. Yeah. Basically. (laughs) You got to follow your instincts. You were right twice. End of the episode. See. I don't. I don't know how they think Quentin did it. I don't understand. This episode had so much potential and then it crashed and burned. If you if you just don't worry about the actual plot and you yeah. just enjoy the characters and the scene, the setting and like Dixie in the basement is fun and yeah, goofy and, and, and Peregrine Slade's awesome, yeah, the funeral's yeah. awesome. Yeah. If you just don't worry about the you know actual plot, plot the murder part of the midsummer. Yes, if you just enjoy the midsummer, yes. then it's fine. I would agree. Uh, who's the best dead body, Isabel, well, Duncan, or Keith? We're going to do uh, after the credits. No, I want to know the best corpse first. The best corpse is Keith in the fridge by far. Yeah, I think so. Because the other two are breathing. Yeah. And they're just kind of laying around. Yeah. With like Technicolor blood on Keith them. Keith in the fridge was, he, like we've said this before, it's not near the level of the guy on the. In the crop circle? No, not the guy <laughs> in the crop circle. Because he's the, the highest Or order. the guy on the, on the plow. Yeah. But he's in that position a long time. Yeah. With those stinky chicken wings right there. And 
he like that's a fridge. Yeah, it's a real fridge. It's not on. And they paled him up real well they too. They paled so he him looks up really legitimately well. cold. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gotta be Keith in the fridge. I agree. So after the credits, Ruth and Leo are in love. Oh, they have no impediments. I have in my notes and tons of money. Yes, Melrose needs to divorce that woman. The Plunkets are out of debt. Derek needs to divorce that woman. Yeah. I don't know. I think Derek and, and Margaret are a good pair. When she comes to the funeral to tell him about the weighted lure, he actually cares about what she's telling him. Yeah, he does. He's in. He's in yeah. Right? Yeah. Quentin goes to jail. And um, Dixie's very happy. Dixie's happy. Yeah. Yep. And Cully drives away in the library mobile. Only to be seen again in the next episode, Death and Dreams. <laughs> episode 250602. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> wow. I, I, I started making my notes on this episode already. The bulletin boards on the side of the bookmobile have been updated. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I had them. I was, it was at lunch today and I was at work and I had both scenes up on my screens on my monitors. You I were two comparing monitors. two bookmobile billboards? And one of my colleagues came in and looked at me and was like, oh. I don't even have to ask what you're doing. Yes. I know what you're doing. Yes. What blows me away. What? I love you. Yes. No, I love you. And all of your oddness. Cause I'm odd too. You look so closely that you read Isabel's obituary. You read the bookmobile notice board. Yes. But it wasn't until we were watching it together, so like the third time you've seen it, that you noticed that this is addressed set sign. Yes. (laughs) That's huge compared to anything else you're analyzing. (laughs) Well, it was too big and obvious for me to notice it. I I went so (laughs) Canadian this week. This week, like last week's episode was... Murder on St. Mally's Day, which we may have a story about that yeah. sometime soon. Um, we noticed a sign that said that the set was all dressed and don't change anything. Mm-hmm. And literally, I had about two hours of guilt this week about thinking about pointing that out, making the people who were the set dressers feel bad because we noticed it. You really are Canadian. And then I was like, I wonder if they listen to the podcast. <laughs> I wonder if they'd be willing to be interviewed on the podcast. We can confirm, okay? We can confirm that a person who has appeared in the show has listened to the podcast. Yes, one. We, we can confirm that one. Hey, if you're out there and you've had an extra role, if you've been behind the guy who's behind the guy who's behind the guy in an episode yep. of Midsummer, yep. we would be... Very we happy to talk to you. To talk to you. We'd love to interview some we, folks related to the show. We'd love to, to talk show. to anybody related to the show. Absolutely. So. Even in the smallest part. It would be really fun. All right. So, so that- next episode is uh, 25. I can't believe we have 25 episodes. Woo-hoo! I can't believe we're almost at 10,000 downloads. This is insane. Yeah, I baby. Just am so pleased that you guys are listening. I heard, I heard somebody today on the Twitter said that I skip a bunch of episodes every time I rewatch them. But now that I listen to the podcast, I rewatch those episodes. Oh, f- fun question for this week. Yes. We were talking about this the other night. Yes. If you could pick any British actor to have a cameo in a midsummer, yes. who would you want to see? Oh. Not Stephen Fry. No, He's the most obvious choice. Stephen Fry is the most obvious. We need to have Stephen Fry on the show. Toot sweet. My choice is David Mitchell. I want to see David Mitchell or Sandy Toxvig and I in want, a midsummer. And I want Greg Davies. <laughs> His giant lumberingness. Or Noel Fielding. Noel Fielding. He'd be really fun. He would. <laughs> or um, Ross uh, Noble. Ross Noble. We'd also like There's Ross There's Noble. some choices for you, but I'm yep. sure folks out there listening will have some even better choices. Absolutely. And you got to tell us, when you tell us uh, who you nominate to, to have a cameo in a midsummer whether they're a victim or a killer. Yep. Give us some story. Have yeah. fun with it. What role do you think they would play? So Death and Dreams is our next episode in uh, Killer Children. Yeah. So we'll see you then. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs.
Ha! Okay. Are you ready? If you're going to be that loud, you got to turn it down. Padre. <laughs> Wrong mystery show.